Before I start the video, I want to say that a lot of people watch my videos without a subscription. If my content resonates with you, you could subscribe to the channel, thus YouTube would promote it more, which in turn would motivate me to release and improve content more often. Thank you. Catherine Ann Olsen had always loved theatre. She had a passion for performing, and she was eager to begin her career in the field. But for now, she was working part-time as a nanny to make ends meet. It wasn't her dream job, but she was grateful for the opportunity. One day, while browsing Craigslist, Catherine saw an ad for a babysitting job. It was posted by a woman named Emmy, who was looking for someone to watch her child the following day. Catherine was thrilled. She had been looking for a new job, and this seemed like the perfect opportunity. The next morning, Catherine arrived at the address provided in the ad. It was a rundown split level in Savage, Minnesota. The front yard was overgrown, and the paint was peeling off the house. But Catherine wasn't deterred. She was excited to meet Emmy and her child. As she walked up to the front door, she was greeted by a young man named Michael John Anderson. He was 19 and liked to play paintball. He told Catherine that Emmy was running late and asked if she would like to come inside and wait. Catherine hesitated for a moment, but then she decided it was better to be early than late for her new job. Anderson led her up to his bedroom on the second floor. Catherine felt uneasy. She had expected to meet a mother and her child, not a teenage boy in a messy bedroom. But she tried to push her doubts aside and focus on the job at hand. As she was getting settled in the bedroom, Catherine heard a noise downstairs. She stood up to investigate, and that's when Anderson pulled out a gun. Catherine tried to run, but Anderson shot her in the back with a 357 Magnum. She fell to the floor, gasping for air. Anderson dragged her body down the stairs and stuffed her in the trunk of his car. He drove a few blocks away and abandoned the car. Then, in an attempt to cover his tracks, he crushed Catherine's cell phone and wrapped it up in a bloody towel before dropping it into a public trash can. But Anderson had made a fatal mistake. He didn't realize that the towel had his name written on it in black marker. The police were able to track him down and arrest him for Catherine's murder. The trial was long and grueling. Anderson tried to argue that he was mentally ill and not responsible for his actions. But the evidence was overwhelming and he was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without parole. Catherine's family and friends were devastated by her loss. She was a bright young woman with a promising future, and her life was cut tragically short by a senseless act of violence. But they were determined to keep her memory alive. In the years since her death, Catherine's loved ones have established a scholarship in her name to support aspiring theatre students. They hope that through this scholarship, Catherine's passion for the arts will live on and inspire future generations. As for Michael John Anderson, he remains behind bars, serving out his sentence for Catherine's murder. But no amount of punishment can ever undo the damage he has done. Catherine's death was a tragedy that will be felt for years to come. The timeless advice that has been echoed for generations is to never hire a prostitute through Craigslist and definitely never pay up front. Numerous reports of individuals posing as sex workers and then stealing from their clients have circulated on the internet. However, these stories pale in comparison to the tragedy that befell Jennifer Papain, a 26-year-old Long Island-based prostitute who advertised her services on Craigslist. On March 24, 2010, Chad Johnson, a 23-year-old man, contacted Papain. She didn't think much of it since it was just another job. For $80, she agreed to meet Johnson in his car and fulfill their agreement. Unfortunately, the situation didn't go according to plan. During their encounter, Johnson asked for his money back, which Papain declined. This caused Johnson to become violent, putting his hands around her neck and choking her to death. Papain couldn't even scream for help before he choked off her windpipe. Johnson then drove to a wooded area near the Long Island Expressway, and buried Papain's body in a shallow grave. The news of Jennifer Papain's murder shook the entire community. The police launched a massive investigation, interviewing anyone who may have had contact with her. 
but it wasn't until they traced the phone call from Johnson to Pepain that they were able to identify a suspect. Johnson was eventually apprehended and charged with first-degree murder. The trial was highly publicized, with details of the gruesome crime being shared in the news and on social media. Johnson maintained his innocence, claiming that he had paid for sex with Pepain, but had not killed her. The prosecution, however, had a strong case against Johnson. DNA evidence found at the scene matched his, and witnesses had seen him with Pepain on the night of her murder. The defense argued that the DNA evidence could have been contaminated and that there was no concrete evidence linking Johnson to the crime. But it was Johnson's own words that ultimately led to his conviction. In a recorded conversation with his cellmate, Johnson had confessed to the murder, detailing the events of that fateful night. He had become angry when Pepain refused to give him his money back, and in a fit of rage, he had strangled her. The jury deliberated for several hours before delivering a verdict of guilty. Johnson was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Pepain family finally had some closure, but the tragedy of Jennifer's murder would never be forgotten. Her story served as a cautionary tale for both sex workers and clients alike. The dangers of meeting strangers for sex, especially through online platforms, were now more evident than ever before. The community rallied around the Pepain family, holding candlelight vigils and fundraisers in her memory. Her legacy became one of hope and strength in the face of tragedy. The memory of her tragic death would forever be a reminder of the need for caution and safety in an increasingly dangerous world. Morema Alejandro was in shock when she heard the news of her roommate's brutal murder. She and Luis Oliva had been close friends since they were teenagers in Denver. After Oliva moved to Mesa County, he asked her to move in with him to share the rent. Alejandra agreed, and they settled into a cosy apartment. She never imagined that she would be living with someone running a male massage service on Craigslist, but she wasn't one to judge. When Oliver didn't show up to pick her up at the bus station, she tried calling him, but got no answer. She waited for hours until she couldn't take it anymore and called the police. The officers who arrived at the scene found Oliver's body lying naked on an air mattress, surrounded by a pool of blood. The brutal murder sent shockwaves throughout the community, and the police launched an extensive investigation. As the investigation unfolded, suspicion fell on Oliver's partner, Brandon Wathen, who lived with him. But Wathen's alibi checked out, and he was working out of town on the night of the murder. Investigators then turned to Craigslist records and email communications, hoping to find a lead. They discovered that Oliver had been running a male massage service on Craigslist, and many of his clients were married men who wanted to keep their activities secret. The investigation led them to one man. Billy Joe Delacy, an army veteran who had apparently been Oliver's last customer before his death. Delacy's story was convoluted and inconsistent. He first denied having gone to Oliver's apartment, then admitted to it, but claimed he left before anything happened. He also claimed he was paying rent at the time of the murder, but his checks were dated after the killing. Investigators found child pornography on his computer, but he insisted that he had stolen it. The investigation dragged on for months, with Lees turning up dead ends. But finally, in 2012, Delacy was arrested in Pennsylvania and indicted for first-degree murder. The case went to trial, and the evidence against Delacy was overwhelming. Prosecutors presented a timeline of events that suggested Delacy had killed Oliva in a fit of jealousy after finding out that Oliva had been seeing other clients. The climax of the trial came when Delacy took the stand. He denied the charges against him, claiming that he had nothing to do with Oliva's murder. But under cross-examination he faltered, and his story began to unravel. The jury found him guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Morema Alejandro was relieved that justice had been served, but the memory of her friend's brutal murder would stay with her for a long time. She moved back to Denver to be with her family and start a new chapter in her life. The case of Luis Oliva's murder was one of the most challenging investigations in Mesa County's history, but it was a testament to the dedication and perseverance of the local law enforcement agencies 
that they were able to bring the killer to justice. Diane Warwick was a woman with a troubled past, marked by violence and criminal behavior. She had been convicted of robbing a pharmacy in Colorado in 1988, and nine years later, she stormed into a drug recovery program with two handguns and took a counselor hostage. She spent an hour taking pot shots at the police before being wounded and apprehended. The judge found her not guilty by reason of insanity, and she spent the next six years in a mental hospital. After her release, Warwick moved to Pleasant Hill, California, where she answered a Craigslist ad to serve as a caregiver for 70-year-old Mary Jane Scanlon. Scanlon was confined to a wheelchair, and Warwick's duties included helping her eat and getting her in and out of bed. At first, everything seemed to be going well. Warwick was friendly and professional, and Scanlon appeared to be pleased with her new caregiver. But then, something changed. Warwick started to act strangely, becoming increasingly agitated and paranoid. She began to accuse Scanlon of stealing from her and spying on her. Scanlon tried to reassure Warwick, but it was clear that something was seriously wrong. One day, while Scanlon was sitting in her wheelchair, Warwick suddenly attacked her with a knife. Scanlon tried to defend herself, but she was no match for Warwick's strength and ferocity. Warwick stabbed her repeatedly, ignoring her pleas for mercy. After the attack, Warwick fled the scene and was eventually arrested at a nearby trailer park. She was charged with murder and faced a long prison sentence. At her trial, Warwick claimed that she had hallucinated that she was attacking her father when she killed Scanlon. But the jury was not convinced. It found her guilty of murder and sentenced her to 31 years to life in prison. The case of Diane Warwick shocked the community and raised questions about the safety of hiring caregivers through online ads. It also served as a reminder of the importance of thorough background checks and careful vetting of anyone who is entrusted with the care of vulnerable individuals. In the end, Mary Jane Scanlon's tragic death was a reminder that we must remain vigilant and take steps to protect ourselves and our loved ones from those who would do us harm. The story of Diane Warwick is a cautionary tale that will not soon be forgotten. James Sanders was a hard-working man who did everything to provide for his family. He had a beautiful wife and two sons, and they were his whole world. However, money was tight, and he was looking for a way to make some extra cash. He had a diamond ring that he thought would fetch a good price, so he put it up for sale on Craigslist. After receiving a reply to his ad, James invited the prospective buyers over to his house to have a look at the ring. He wasn't sure if they were trustworthy, but he was willing to take the risk. He was hoping to bring in at least $1,000, money that might have helped out the family. When the couple arrived that night, James was home with his family. He let them into the house, but as soon as they were inside, the husband pulled out a handgun and ordered everyone to get onto the floor. James and his family were terrified, and they had no idea what was going on. While they tied up the Sanders family, Two more armed men forced their way into the home. One of the new arrivals got rough and smacked Sanders' 14-year-old son with the barrel of his pistol. It was a brutal and violent attack, and James knew he had to do something to protect his family. That was more than James Sanders could take. Wrenching himself free of his restraints, he dove at the man who had hit his son, only to be shot three times. He died in his wife's arms, in front of his terrified children. The family was traumatized, and they would never be the same. The police were called, and an investigation was launched. It wasn't long before they found out who was responsible for the brutal attack on the Sanders family. Three days later, a traffic stop in California led to the arrest of three of the suspects, Kiyoshi Higashi, Joshua Reese, and Amanda Knight. They were charged with murder, robbery, and kidnapping. A few days later, the fourth suspect, Claban Bernard, turned himself in in the face of a massive statewide manhunt. The four of them were sentenced to seven, nine, one, two, three years in prison for their crimes. However, no amount of time behind bars could make up for the pain and suffering they had caused the Sanders family. James Sanders was a loving husband and father who did everything he could to provide for his family. 
His tragic death was a senseless act of violence that left his family shattered. It was a reminder that there are still people out there who are willing to do anything for money, even if it means taking the life of an innocent man. The Sanders family will never forget what happened that night, but they will always remember James as a loving husband, father, and hero who gave his life to protect his family.